So I guess the first thing that I wanted to look at is uh, why would we change the way we're producing food that we're all consuming and millions of Americans are consuming. And I wanted to just uh, like link soil health and human health. Some of you will have heard all this information before. I'm just going through this first bit like really, really quickly. But I think it's important that we establish why it is that we definitely need to change the way we produce food um, in this country. So the USA spends twice as much on uh, health care as any other country in the world, but you rank 17th in terms of your health and your life expectancy in this country. So there's a disconnect between the amount of money spent on on health in this country and what those out, what the outcomes are. And the cause, I was looking at a recent article on the causes of death in London in 1705 and they just had a list um, of all the things that people had died from and I couldn't see anything on that list that is now currently on our list of the things that people die from. So back in those days people died from infectious diseases um, like the plague and that, that sort of thing but there was other things as well like tuberculosis and other, others that now don't feature very much in our society today and when we look at the leading causes of death today here in the United States cardiovascular disease, cancer and Alzheimer's uh, top that list and those three uh, autoimmune disorders are actually nutritionally related and 54% of children here in the United States now suffer some kind of chronic illness. Um, if you talk, if any of you have children or grandchildren or you're linked with people like school teachers, um, they'll tell you about just the incredible range of illnesses that kids are turning up with uh, in schools now or in homes, like especially things like skin rashes, uh, food allergies, um, headaches and all kinds of unexplained things. Until recent, well in the last say 10 years, um, leukemia has been the number one killer of children and then just recently brain cancer has taken over leukemia. Brain cancer is now the number one killer of children under the age of 15. So we have to wonder why is it that we've got all these things with our body is actually just not functioning effectively, it's breaking down. It's, we're, we're not getting um, the sorts of things that we used to, a disease was once something that you caught from someone else was an infectious organism and it was transferable. Um, now we have things like, you know, you can't catch a stroke or cardiovascular disease or diabetes or something from someone else. These are not infectious diseases. This is the body actually breaking down. It's failing to function as it should. And these autoimmune disorders, what are so-called autoimmune disorders, like what happens in your body, uh, there is now 80 known ones and there's a whole lot of mysterious ones as well. So that's, this is incredible that there are so many, they keep getting added to the list. You'll be talking to someone, they say, well, my doctor said, I've got some kind of autoimmune disorder, but they can't even put a name on it. My body's just not functioning effectively. But the ones that we can put names on include things like diabetes. That's probably the one that's really taken off the most. Or, and then cancer. It's predicted that one in two people, not, not long from now, one in two people will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. Autism, and you know, the numbers for autism are going through the roof. I think it's... Uh, someone was telling me it, the other day in California that it's predicted that by 1950 or something, one in two children will be born autistic. Alzheimer's, of course, you're all very well aware of that in this country. It's probably um, a more significant. If there are some developing countries that you go to where it's, most of these diseases are unheard of, particularly Alzheimer's, uh, dementia, lupus, multiple sclerosis, inflammatory bowel disease rheumatoid arthritis and so on. So they collectively cost trillions of dollars a year, which is why the USA health bill is just, um, the health costs are escalating. But they also, of course, uh, cause a lot of uh, um, unhappiness and uh, pain in, in our families. Uh, you know, we don't really want to have these kinds of things happening to us and truly they are, are all related to what you eat and how what you eat is produced. So autoimmune disorders currently affect one in six Americans and those numbers are growing daily and more Americans are actually dying from a poor diet than any other factor. So part of the problem is poor food choices. I mean when you see what people, if, you, if you're in the supermarket buying food and you look at what people, I've, I see people with the cart just like totally loaded up with stuff that none of it I would call food. There wouldn't be one single item in there that I would call food. But even people who are trying to 
make good food choices have a difficulty actually getting the minerals and trace elements that they need due to the way that the food is being produced. So one of the things I was going to just touch on briefly this morning before we get into biology is the nitrogen story, which has been a very big story here in the United States. I think something like 49 states in the US now have contaminated groundwater and that groundwater is contaminated with nitrate. There are um, also lots of other, and, and nitrate is a very potent carcinogen. It's carcinogenic at two parts per million, and I think your allowable level in the states here is something like 10 parts per million. So the fact that uh, it's still regarded as being safe to drink at 10 parts per million is only because above that it uh, causes blue baby syndrome where babies actually die from drinking it. But at less than 10 parts per million, it's still a very potent carcinogen. So lots of times when the groundwater is uh, regarded as being safe, it's not actually safe. So the nitrogen story, uh, this is a very interesting story. You'd actually wonder how it came to be that we've got into this situation. For a start, when you apply nitrogen, only 10 to 40% of it is taken up by plants in the year of application. So that means we lose 6 to 90% of what we, what we apply. Um, some of that is going to denitrify. Some of it's going to go up into the atmosphere. Um, some of it's going to leach through to groundwater um, or just be carried in surface runoff. So when nitrogen is applied, it's it's highly mobile element and plants simply can't take up what is applied in one go. Like how, how, the way that it's applied, it's not possible for a plant, a plant can't take up all the nitrogen you apply and then store it for later. It's only going to take up what it can use immediately and that's only 10 to 40% of it. The rest of it, you lose. So what that means is that there's $100 billion worth of nitrogen fertilizers applied globally and 60 to $90 billion of that either goes up into the atmosphere or uh, pollutes the water. So you might as well just get $100 bills and chuck them out, really. Um, and there's over 500 oceanic dead zones now around the world. You have some famous ones here in the United States, um, down in the Gulf and uh, up the, uh, Chesapeake Bay and those kinds of places. And then you've got some inland ones like Lake Erie, I guess. Um, but then around the world, you know, this is not just a US problem. There are 500 of these dead zones. We've got some famous ones around Australia too, and New Zealand has, and uh, it's everywhere. So this is not just a United States problem. Um, but just to give you one example of another issue with nitrogen fertilizers is that they acidify soils. And in Washington State, I was talking to Steve Applebaum Barn the other day, and some of you may know Steve, he was saying the pH of their calcareous soils has fallen from 8, so H is a... Eight is a high pH, like it's an alkaline soil, down to four, which is a very acidic soil. That's a massive drop in pH, and he says we're just seeing this routinely now with soil acidity being an issue where it was before the soil was alkaline. So inorganic nitrogen also forms non-protein nitrogen. We could talk about that at length, but I won't. If, you're, if you have livestock, that is a real issue because they cannot digest non-protein nitrogen. It's actually a poison to their systems. Um, and it stimulates weeds, which again, if we're talking just our row cropping and we're putting in on and plants are using only 10 to 40 percent of it and the rest of it's a pollutant, but it's also stimulating weeds and then we end up having to use herbicides and then there's a whole lot of reasons how that affects um, other things that affect the metabolic processes within that plant. We end up using things like insecticides and fungicides simply because we started with a nitrogen fertilizer that has... Um, made the plant unable to deal with other things in its environment. So they're expensive, they're inefficient and they're polluting, so why do we use them? Well, it is true that applying N does make plants grow. If you were, if you were doing an experiment in a, in a glass house like, and you had some pots with just soil um, with no nitrogen and then you have some others with soil and you add nitrogen, these plants will grow more. But the problem with all of those experiments is that those pots are not biologically active. That soil that's used in those experiments has been collected months before or years before and piled up in a great big bunker somewhere and hasn't had living plant roots in it. Um, and then it's all going to be homogenized and possibly sterilized before it's put into all those pots. So what you're seeing is that seeds are going to be put into soil that is not a biologically active soil. There's no mechanism there for plants to be able to get nitrogen in any other way other than the fertilizer that was 
placed on those and so you add fertiliser and the plants grow more and it's not, uh, it's not a deliberate act, I don't think. It's just that that's what we see when we do an experiment in that way. And in the same way as if we have a field that's where the soil's not biologically active, if it's been um, ploughed and ploughed and ploughed or sprayed and sprayed and sprayed and left bare for long periods of time between crops and we haven't actually actively been doing things to keep that soil as a living thing, apply nitrogen, plants grow more because they have no other way to get it. Whereas in a natural system, plants can get all of the nitrogen that they need and it doesn't matter what kind of plants they are, if they're green, they have some kind of relationship with nitrogen fixing bacteria. So we have this fixation on legumes because of their association with rhizobium. And why do we always think about legumes? It's because rhizobium is a nitrogen fixing bacteria that we can cultivate in the laboratory. We can make an inoculum. We can inoculate seeds with rhizobium and we can get um, good legume growth. But in fact, there are thousands of different kinds of nitrogen fixing bacteria and 999 of those cannot be cultured in the laboratory. So we cannot make an inoculum from those other ones, but they are all there in a natural environment. And if you think about it, if you go somewhere in the world where there is a diverse, rich kind of a natural environment like the Amazon rainforest, I guess, or something like that, um, there aren't any legumes there really. There may be one or two, but it's not really um, a situation where you've got lots of leguminous plants and you've got massive amounts of dry matter production, like the biomass production is huge. So in fact, we see that the most productive environments on earth actually have very few, if any, legumes in them. And the science is now showing that in diverse mixes, like if you were looking at your forage, forage mixes or your cover crop mixes, um, the science is showing that the ones that don't have legumes in them actually build soil faster and fix a lot more nitrogen. So what we want is diversity rather than this single focus that we have on nitrogen fertilizer. And the problem with adding nitrogen to a plant is that they become empty vessels. Yes, we do get more biomass, but it doesn't have anything else very much in it um, because it has, we've, what we've done is formed a disconnect. When the plant has to get its own nitrogen, it has to produce root exudates to uh, support nitrogen fixing bacteria and in the same process as supporting nitrogen fixing bacteria, it's supporting a whole lot of other bacteria and fungi that are able to bring calcium and magnesium and sulfur and phosphorus and zinc and boron and everything that that plant needs. So if we short circuit that process, apply nitrogen, the plant will grow but it doesn't have all those trace elements in it that it needs for its own immune system to function effectively. So it's going to be susceptible to insect attack, it's going to be susceptible to fungal attack, etc., etc. And then we're put in the situation of having to apply those things as well as nitrogen. So it becomes very expensive to produce a crop under that system where we are starting off with an inorganic fertiliser leads us down the path of having to apply a whole lot of other things. So if we just look at some data on that um, from Australian grass-fed dairy, all our dairy is grass-fed, um, but if we look at nitrogen applied to pasture and relate that to milk production, what we see is that we have, uh, this is the amount of nitrogen being applied. So over time, farmers are applying more and more nitrogen as they have here in the United States trying to get things to grow more. But when we look at milk production over that same period, there hasn't been really any relationship between those two curves. And this was put together by um, the university. Two professors at the university who put this data together said that this increase in milk production over time was due to improved animal genetics and the selection process that was taking place in having uh, dairy cows that were actually able to produce more milk for a given amount of feed. It wasn't because they were being better fed. So there is no relationship in a pasture situation between how much nitrogen you apply. You might, you might get more bulk of feed, but it actually hasn't got anything in it that animals need. And then the same thing happens with grains and with, with vegetables. We put nitrogen on and things grow more, but the, the nutrients aren't there. So you can eat more of it, but it's not actually satisfying your need for nourishment. So we've got all these empty calories now, which are part of the issue that we have with uh, things like diabetes. And it goes largely unrecognised. 
And then this reduced plant uptake of the minerals and trace elements ha obviously has a, a flow-on effect for, for animal and human health. Now, no civilization has outlived the health of its citizens, right? If we all fail to what, what is happening with our society now is that not only do we have this extraordinary expansion in autoimmune disorders and kids being born with all kinds of, uh, uh, I don't know what the right word for it is, but it's, they're not really diseases, but all kinds of issues with their metabolism that we weren't seeing in kids 50 years ago. But we as a species are actually failing to reproduce as well. Infertility in young couples is somewhere between 25 and 30 percent. People needing to have uh, go to a have in vitro fertilization or something like that, assisted fertility. So fertility clinics are just booming around the world in developed countries. I think I, I heard a report the other day, unverified, but that infertility rates in young couples in Japan was 70 percent. Um, we certainly know that in our dairy cows, like they're out on pastures that are getting all this nitrogen and then all the other stuff that goes with it, that we have an infertility problem with our dairy cows as well. That's up around um, 20 percent. So it's not just in humans; it's like in, in animal populations. And if we stop, if we fail to reproduce, well, <laughs> it's the end of the story, right? So no civilization has outlived the health of its citizens, and we've known for many, many centuries where we've seen civilizations fail that no civilization has outlived the usefulness of its soils. And there's classic examples of that from history. So if we look at the effect of this mineral depletion that we're seeing uh, in conventionally fertilized crops, what has the effect of that actually been on the plants? Well, what we're seeing is this increased susceptibility to pests and diseases, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, every other day, there's some new thing that's emerged that you know, soybeans got something wrong with it, or the citrus trees are producing green uh, oranges that won't turn orange, and all these kind of weird things that we're starting to see turn up now in agriculture and horticulture um, that no one's got a name for or no one can figure out what's going on. Then we have to apply expensive insecticides and fungicides, and this reduces your profits, and then we're adding all these unnecessary chemicals to the food chain. Really, we can produce food in a way where we do not need insecticides, we do not need fungicides. And one of the problems with those chemicals is that now when we look at the consumers of the food, we're consuming all of us food that's very, very uh, low in essential trace elements and minerals. I mean, look at the supplements market. There's a whole, you know, like in Australia now, there'll be a whole row of the, uh, a whole aisle in the supermarket that'll just be loaded with supplements. Uh, why are we needing to take supplements? Because we're not getting the things that we need in our food. So we've got food of low nutritional value and then it's loaded with toxins. So it's a real double whammy for our bodies to try and deal with all of that. And what does that do to our... <clears throat> can't look down. <laughs> what does that do to our bottom line? This has uh, become quite a famous graph. It's uh, Darren Corman who recently wrote an interesting book on all of this. Uh, that's Canadian net farm income, but applies equally well to the United States, to Australia, to Europe. Uh, and here we have from 80 year period from 1926 through to 2016, this blue area here is the gross value of agricultural production. In other words, you know, what is the total value of everything that, that was being produced in Canada in the agricultural context? And of course, it varies with seasons, it varies with commodity prices, and it's not unexpected that this this uh, amount goes up and down over time, but the trend is up. This here is net uh, farm income, net farm income over the same time. So what we found in the early period here is that net farm income was following gross farm production as you'd expect and as you'd hope. In a good year, we have a good season, we produce more, farmers make more. Um, when commodity prices are good, we receive more for our production and farmers make more. But then there, then there was a disconnect. The, the gross value of production continues to go up and the net value of production is going down. And here was uh, when corn, the cost of producing corn was more than the value of that corn and you've probably all been in that situation yourself so you know what that feels like. And we had the same thing happen in Australia and New Zealand with dairy. Cost more to produce milk than what you would, could receive for that milk. So farmers that continued to produce milk were actually losing money 
around, on average around $200,000 a year just for continuing to have dairy cows and produce milk. So, so what's going on here? Like, this is still going up, this one's going down. And what Darren worked out was that in, that, in the last 32 years it, that he was looking at from 1985 to 2016, the input suppliers, the providers of the fertilizers and the insecticides and the fungicides and also the tractors and also the banks that were lending money and all of those, everything that's associated with agriculture received 1.32 trillion of the 1.35 trillion of agricultural production, in other words, 98%. That's sort of become my mantra now when I see people putting stuff on their, <laughs> their crops or giving supplements to animals or something, that there's your 98%, there's your 98%. So farmers are only actually getting 2% from all the hard work and effort that goes into farming are getting a very, very low um, return. In, in agriculture. There's other people out there that are making plenty of money from the agricultural sector, but it's not farmers. So just bear that in mind about the 98%. So the majority of Canadian farmers are supported by off-farm income, taxpayer-funded support schemes, asset sales and borrowed money. Um, that probably sounds familiar. Farm debt is at a record high and farm debt in the USA is also at a record high. And we're repeatedly told that we need to produce more to get out of this mess, but it's not actually about maximising yield when you look at it in terms if you sit down and start looking at your farm production figures and your costs and your, um, your incomes and everything, it's actually about optimising profit. We need to start thinking about it's not the person that has the highest yield at the end of the day that necessarily is the one that makes the most from it. And we have to regenerate the resource base because we could spend a whole day here talking about soil degradation and issues with erosion. You know, soil has been the United States' biggest export for at least the last 100 years. There's more soil goes off most areas of land than there is any other product. So if we look at this worldwide, we find that excessive use of nitrogen and also phosphorus, I didn't talk about phosphorus, but we could make pretty much the same arguments for phosphorus. It's caused soil degradation, it's caused environmental pollution, reduced soil biodiversity, um, and then we have trace element deficiencies in plants, animals and people. So I think it would be fairly safe to say that the current approach to farming and food production has been a big fail for all of those reasons, health reasons, environmental reasons, um, and the reason that it's not hugely profitable for farmers these days to actually be in farming. So how about we take a different approach, which is what today is going to be about, and talk about supporting microbes rather than using high analysis fertiliser and how might we support those microbes and why would we want to? I mean, what can microbes do that, that we can't do? So let's have a little look at the soil microbiome and just see how this world actually does work and why it is that if we, um, why would we want to take a different approach anyway? <laughs> um, so a recent census of life on Earth this was last year. This was a scientific study of all the life on Earth and it was measured in gigatons of carbon because all living things are made of carbon. We're made of carbon and the trees and the grasses and the insects and the cows and like every living thing is made of carbon and microbes are made of carbon as well. So that's how we define something as living. If it's got carbon in its body, then it's a living thing. Um, and they looked, they discovered, they calculated that there was 550 gigatons of carbon-based life forms on Earth, and a gigaton is a billion tonnes, so that's, that's a lot. And unsurprisingly, 450 of the 550 gigatons of carbon-based life forms were, were actually plants, because in most places when you look around you, the, the living thing that you see is plants. Here, you, here you're looking at um, lots of acres of crops. In other parts of the world, you'd be looking at acres of trees. Uh, or trees and shrubs, but as a general rule, unless you go into a desert somewhere, what you're seeing around you is mostly plants. So it's not surprising that the majority of life on Earth is actually, in terms of weight, is actually in plants. But then the other living things that make up the remaining 100 gigatons, so we've got most of, um, most of our carbon-based life forms is, is, is plants, and then what makes up the other 100 gigatons of life? And that's where it was got really interesting because it was the things that we can't see. Things that we can't see make up 93% of that one other 100 gigatons of life on Earth. And these microscopic things, we call them the protists, the archaea, the fungi, the bacteria, um, 
constitute the majority of life on Earth in weight terms, um, apart from plants. And this, if we look at this diagrammatically, we see we've got the protists up here in the orange, archaea in the purple, fungi in the green, and bacteria are whacking 70% of that other 100 uh, gigatons. And this is, this is by weight, this is not by number. Um, humans don't even feature on that graphic there because we're, by weight, we are so small compared to all the microbes. Remember the things we can't see. Um, things we can see, like insects, the mollusks, they're th things like slugs and snails, but also in the, in the ocean we have um, oysters and clams and scallops and pippies and all those things we, we like to eat are all in that mollusk group. And then of course there's the fish. And think how big the oceans are, they cover something like 70% of the planet. Think of all the life that's in there. Um, you know, not, not only the, the fish and the shellfish, but you know, you've got the sharks and the whales and all kinds of everything that lives in the ocean. Um, all the things that live in soil, like annelids and nematodes. Um, any of you who are involved in, uh, in, in ecology of soils, there's lots and lots of living things that we can see in soils in a healthy soil if you go to a healthy prairie. Then there's our animals, like our, our sheep and our cattle and, um, and also our domestic pets. And then humans, hey, yeah, we actually get a get a look in there. <laughs> Collectively, all these things that we see that we think of as being life on Earth make up 7% of life on Earth. And humans, well, we're 0.01% in terms of biomass of life on Earth. And I'm talking weight here. Well, we have really punched above our weight, haven't we? For 0.01% of the biomass of life on Earth, we've managed to destroy about 99% of the rest of it. And that's why we really do have to change because we, we actually depend on all that other life, the things that we depend on, the things we can't see for our health. Um, and again, we could talk, we could spend all today, today, today just talking about the human gut microbiome and how that functions and how the microbes in our gut are the primary drivers of our health, which is now being recognised and there's a lot of work going into um, doing something about that. Um, the microbes that are in your animal's gut are the primary drivers of your livestock's health and the microbes that are in your soil are the primary drivers of your soil health and therefore of your farm income because if your soil's not healthy, your plants can't be healthy and then you're having to pour on all these other chemicals to try and get a yield um, to sell. So we're talking by weight there, not by number and if we look at numbers, they're even more staggering because we know that one teaspoon of healthy soil contains more microbes than all the humans there are on Earth. And soil is not as microbially rich as some other environments like the rumen um, of a cow. If you take one drop, just, um, you know, like just pick up something and just one drop that falls off that of rumen fluid contains 10,000 times more microbes than there are humans on the entire planet. We think we're so big and so clever and really when we start looking at finer and finer scales we see that everything is being organised by, um, well I can't say everything's being organised by, I'm, I should say that it's microbes that are responsible for how things function at a biochemical level, like how the chemistry is being influenced all of the time by microbes. And then we can go to an even finer scale. So these guys weren't mentioned, measured in this census of life on Earth. Viruses are actually the most abundant entity on Earth by orders of magnitude. And if you are particularly interested in viruses, I can send you some mind-blowing um, articles about them. For example, if you were just to put something out like this, just put it outside and leave it for 30 minutes or something, the surface of it will be totally covered in viruses that have just floated down out of the atmosphere and there would be uh, hundreds and thousands probably of different kinds. Most of them that we have no idea what they actually do. They're not living things according to the science. The science is that a, a living thing is something that's able to replicate itself and viruses cannot replicate themselves other than they have to um, invade, if you like, the cell of another living thing and they use your cellular or whatever their host is, they use the cellular energy of the host to replicate. So when you get the flu, for example, um, those viruses were just, just fragments of DNA and RNA will enter your cells, use your cellular energy to reproduce, which is why you feel so tired when you have the flu. But we think of viruses as being 
detrimental because we're familiar with ones like the flu. And at one time that was why we thought bacteria were detrimental because we linked them to some diseases that in fact bacterial diseases that can be lethal. And then we thought fungi were detrimental because we linked them to fungal pathogens. But in actual fact, when we look at bacteria, we find that 99.9% .9 of them are not only beneficial but essential. 99.9% .9 of fungi are not only beneficial but essential and 99.9% .9 of viruses are not only uh, beneficial but essential. And in fact, every single bacterial, fungal and human cell has viruses in it and would not be able to function without those viruses. So that's where we start looking at worlds within worlds and we realise not only are viruses essential to the function of every living thing on the planet, but they are essential to the functioning of our terrestrial, in other words, our land-based and our marine ecosystems. So an entire marine ecosystem is being driven by viral activity in that marine ecosystem and our terrestrial systems are being driven by viral activity, beneficial viral, viral activity. They're essential to the function of our gut microbiome. The, the bacteria that we has all become so famous these days in your gut, they can't function without viruses in them and our immune system can't function without viruses. Again, if anyone wants to read more about this, I can send you some articles on it. Um, and they use quorum sensing to regulate their populations and I'm going to talk about quorum sensing more in a, in a minute. So this is a, some actual photos taken under a microscope of viruses. This is a bacterial cell that's being in the process of breaking down. It's almost had it. Um, and these viruses that are, in this case, they're, they're not beneficial viruses. They look a little bit like parasitic ticks or something. Um, they look like they're living but they're not. Again, here's a uh, Bacillus subtilis. This is what a bacteria, uh, one of these rod-shaped bacteria looks like under a microscope. And these, these are actual pictures. These little guys that are all attacking that are viruses. Again, they look like something from outer space, don't they? Um, this is like a cucumber mosaic virus. That's what that looks like under the microscope. Can't remember what the name of this one was, but I reckon if there are any coming from outer space, that's definitely one of them. And uh, and again, this is another quite a, a common shape. They really do look like living things, but according to the definition, they're not. So if we just take one example of where viruses are hugely influential in, uh, in an ecosystem, if we look at the marine system, at the oceans, we know that plankton in the oceans supply half of the planet's oxygen, um, but they need to get, an, get nitrogen from somewhere. There's lots and lots of bacteria that in seawater as well. And what happens is that viruses actually prey on those bacteria um, and once they're decomposing, they liberate the nitrogen that was in their bodies and that nitrogen is what the plankton need to grow. So if we take a sample of seawater and eliminate the viruses, the plankton that's in that seawater dies because it can't get its nitrogen and then, we've, and then there's no oxygen produced. So the oxygen that we breathe, half of it, comes from marine plankton. And if there weren't viruses in the ocean breaking down bacteria or, or preying on bacteria every day, um, we wouldn't have that oxygen. It's really extraordinary when you see the power of these tiny little things that, that uh, most of us don't even think about. Um, so one study estimated that viruses in the ocean are actually destroying 20% of all bacterial cells in the ocean every day and keeping the system in balance. So remember when I was talking about the magnitude of just even the weight of microbes on the planet and then we remember that viruses are orders of magnitude above the microbes that we are more familiar with. So in the human gut we have about 10 trillion bacteria and, and then there are viruses within those 10 trillion bacteria probably at 10 to 1. So if we have 10 trillion bacteria we have 100 trillion viruses and they're within those bacteria and they're regulating their populations and their behaviour, what they're actually doing is preying on bacteria that the viruses consider are not good for us and actually protecting bacteria that the viruses decided are good for us. So these decisions, if you like, being made by viruses in our gut are having a huge impact on our human health. And it's now the work that's going on in human health, the, the frontier, I guess, of that research is it, it is actually viruses that are the drivers of human health. Um, Whereas all this time we thought that viruses were bad for us. We can't function without them and um, because they can modify the bacteria that then modify the human host. 
So we're just microbe taxis, really, um, and we have to start thinking about, you know, how do we, the, the way we live and the things that we, it, we consume, we have to think about what the effect of those on our microbial populations. So that's why you know, there's been a big move away from antibiotics and things like that, because you take an antibiotic and you're just depleting all the beneficial microbes from your gut as well as the one that you were targeting. And it's interesting that the Americans went down that road of antibiotics. The Russians never did go that way. Um, they, they've gone down the way of understanding how the, mic the specific microbes uh, communicate with each other through quorum sensing, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, and then how to actually scramble those messages so that microbes weren't able to reproduce simply by interfering with the way they communicate with each other, which is what I'm going to get onto in a moment. And that's called quorum. There's quorum sensing, which is how microbes communicate, and then quorum quenching is how you scramble those messages. So instead of having like a broad, broad spectrum antibiotic that just knocks out everything, you just target the specific organism that's causing the issue and the other ones can get on with doing what they should be doing. So the human virome, if you want to read more about that, just Google it. Um, so the human virome influences the human genome because um, when we start talking about quorum sensing, we talk about how those microbes actually affect genetic expression in their host. So the, the microbes in your gut can turn some of your genes on and some of your genes off and the microbes in the rhizosphere of a plant, what lives around the roots of a plant, can switch genes on and off in those plants. And that's where we're starting to see the real reason, I guess, why we need to be, we need to be really, really focused on what is happening in the rhizosphere. Because if the plant has important genes for things like frost tolerance, drought tolerance, uh, resistance to insects and pests and other pests and diseases and those kinds of things, and all of those genes are switched off, then we have a plant that's very, very fragile in quite a hostile environment. And as you know, in a very variable environment these days as far as the weather goes. So we need to have a plant that's more resilient, that's more flexible, that's more able to deal with what the climate, the weather, all the, that is throwing at us. And it needs a wide range of uh, the ability to be able to switch genes on that will help it and it cannot switch those genes on unless it's getting signals from the rhizosphere um, and we're going to talk about those signals is what I'm leading up to. So in the human case, our human genome, our genes can be switched on and off by the microbes in our gut and we now know that it's the viruses that are controlling the bacteria that are doing that. So one other little thing about microbes before I get on to quorum sensing is uh, a relatively new term. It's only been around for 10 years, and that's rhizophagy, and the other word for it is microbivory. So that word uh, evore, or we, we know like there's a herbivore, which is something that eats herbs, like a grasshopper is a herbivore, or a cow is a herbivore, um, or there's a carnivore, which is something that eats meat, like a, like a cat. Um, well, there's an omnivore, like most humans, we eat meat and we eat herbage. Um, so we, so that word, we have carnivore, omnivore, herbivore. So a microvore is something that eats microbes. And ruminants do that, ruminant animals. So your cattle, they eat, they eat uh, grass and other herbages. They're unable to digest cellulose. There is no mammals are able to digest cellulose. So they have all these bacteria in their rumen that produce cellulase enzyme that breaks down cellulose. And in that process, the cows, the cattle, are actually uh, digesting the volatile fatty acids or short-chain fatty acids that come out of that fermentation process, and they're also digesting the microbes. So a whole lot of the microbes that are involved in breaking down cellulose in the rumen are actually utilised by the, by the animal as microbial protein. So your, your cow is consuming um, breakdown products of cellulose and the microbes themselves. Um, and there's lots of instances in our own bodies of where we are engulfing microbes and consuming microbes. So it's not really an unusual thing, but no one realised that plants... So in the animal kingdom, we're aware that this goes on all the time, that things are digesting microbes. It's never actually been thought of as plants being that active or that... Um, in that place where they were actually eating microbes. But now we know that they do because we have the techniques to be able to observe this. So this is a, 
a newly emerged tip, a plant root tip. And what looks like swarms of flies around here are actually microbes that are all gathered around that newly emerged plant root tip. And I think one of the take home messages from today I'd like you to think about when you're thinking about plants is that it's young, actively growing plants and new roots that are the really important things in soils. Once a plant gets to the stage where it switches over from vegetative to reproductive, starts throwing up a seed head, everything around the root zone changes. So if you want plants to be modifying soil, you need to look in the early growth stages and young plants, what, what are they doing? So why do you think all of those microbes are gathered around that newly emerged plant root tip? What are they doing there? Why are they there rather than just being spread out through the soil? Why would they all be gathered around that newly emerged plant root tip? Yeah. Feeding, yep. And what would they be feeding on? Exudates. Okay, so what kinds of things are coming out of the plant root that the exudates, what have they got in them? The sorts of things, sugars and stuff like that. Okay, so these mostly bacteria, but there's also there are fungi and other things in that mix as well. Um, are feeding on very energy rich exudates that are coming out of that plant root tip. So why are there all those why is the plant root producing all those energy rich exudates to attract microbes? Why is the plant doing that? It's using, it, it, it's been photosynthesizing and converting light energy to biochemical energy. That's no mean feat. Um, it's used carbon dioxide and water in that process and in that miracle of photosynthesis we have elements that have just come from the air like the air that we're all sitting in today things that have just come from the air actually turned into the leaves of that plant through photosynthesis. It's made simple sugars and then join those carbon atoms together to make cellulose, which is what the leaves are made from. It's grown roots. Later on, it's going to produce some seeds or some flowers or something. I mean, it's just absolutely extraordinary how a plant builds itself from the air by converting light energy to biochemical energy. So some of that energy that it's gone to all that trouble to transform it's now just got that energy basically just exuding out of its roots. So why would it be giving all that away, giving all those sugars away? It could use that energy to, to grow more roots or grow more leaves or grow seeds or flowers or something. So why are, why are all those exudates coming out of the plant roots? That's what the microbes are all gathered around there for, but, what, but why is the plant doing that? Yeah, so it's going to trade for stuff it needs. And, up until recently, we figured we thought that that trade was going on through things like mycorrhizal fungi and other connectors within that system, that mycorrhizal fungi were like taking carbon from plants and trading it with colonies of bacteria, and that definitely does go on. But now we've seen these, um, and we've got these really fine detailed techniques for actually observing what happens uh, in very, very uh, minute detail. What we're seeing is that when these bacteria and other microbes get really close to the edge of this plant, they're actually engulfed by the plant roots. So the plant is eating the microbes that are surrounding it. This is what's called rhizophagy or microbivory. So the microbes that are consumed get taken into the central part of the plant. They have their cell walls stripped off. All their nutrients are divulged or di um, whatever the right word for that is. The plant actually consumes those nutrients and then this is where it gets really interesting is the DNA is still intact. Um, the DNA of those microbes travels through the plant. These are plant root hairs here. Um, usually you need to look at, the, look at a plant under the microscope to see those. Sometimes you can see plant root hairs with the naked eye. So the DNA after it's had all the nutrients stripped from it is actually moved around here and out through a plant root hair and spat back out or divulged or whatever the word is out into the soil system again so you just have naked DNA going back out into the soil system and that DNA reforms a cell wall and reforms as it was before whatever it was before if it's a bacteria it reforms as a bacteria it gathers up nutrients again or fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere or whatever kind of bacteria it happens to be and then it's attracted by the nutrients coming out of the exudates coming out of the plant root and it gets engulfed again and eaten and has all of its nutrients divested. So we have this cycle of 
um, this cycle, which is called microbivory. So the way that it's described in the scientific literature is that plants nurture microbes in the root zone, which then enter the root tip. They're actually eaten by the plant, but we put it nicely. They don't voluntarily enter the plant root tip. Um, if, if you look at it under like really high magnification, you see that as they get like close to the edge, they're actually engulfed like that. They lose their cell walls. Well, they have them stripped off. Um, and they divulge their nutrients. Again, that's not voluntarily. They have them taken away from them. And then the microbes then leave the plant. Well, the plant actually spits them out um, via the root hair, and then they start the cycle again. So it's really quite an extraordinary thing. And there's not only rhizophagy, but there's lots and lots of other uh, like worlds within worlds going on in the soil. It's an extraordinary ecosystem that we really haven't thought very much about. So I guess to summarise all of that is that all plants and animals, including humans, are embedded, totally embedded in a microbial world. We have microbes all over us as well as in us. And when we go to a new place for the first time, like say you go away on vacation and you go into a little cottage somewhere or whatever, um, you, your microbiome will establish itself in that space. And they say that after you've been there, um, if you come and go from that new space that you haven't been in before, by about the third day when you come into that room, uh, your microbiome will actually recognise the microbiome that's in that room as yours. And it feels more familiar because we're seeing it for the third time, but it also feels more familiar because our microbiome recognises it. And if you go into an environment where the microbiome is continually being removed, like in a hospital, for example, where everything's being sterilised all the time, do you notice that it just doesn't feel comfortable? For me, it doesn't anyway. It doesn't really feel like a, a place where I'd, I'd want to be. There's many reasons for that, obviously. But that very sterile atmosphere, for some people are more sensitive to others, that you can feel that there isn't really a strong microbiome presence there. So we're all embedded in a microbial world and we have a microbial world embedded within us. So what we need to uh, think about is that this is actually a very good thing once we understand how we could utilise these, the power of these microbes for our own benefit. We don't need to look at it as a negative because microbes are actually capable of performing all kinds of things that we as humans are not capable of doing. And in fact, in the agricultural sense, they can do nearly everything that we need to have, have other than actually plant our crop for us and harvest our crop, um, which we need mechanical things to do. But in terms of everything that happens in the soil, the microbes can do for us what we have tried to do with fertilisers and all the chemicals that we use. So we need to figure out how to harness that power um, and put it to good use, I suppose. So how do microbes actually perform all these amazing things, the, these extraordinary things? I'm going to show you a few examples of the sorts of things that microbes can do. They can't see each other, they can't speak to each other, they can't hear anything. And yet we know that they are very, very good at coordinating their behaviour and working together, probably much better organised than we humans are actually when it comes to working together and, and, and achieving tasks. So do they utilise this um, process called quorum sensing? Well, the evidence is coming up pretty strongly that yes, they do. And we now know that in fact um, all microbes actually use this process. So what does that word quorum mean? Well, in a human in human society, we use that term to mean um, the minimum number of the members of an organisation or a group that need to be present in order for some kind of business to be transacted or for a decision to be made. So if, this, if the fairgrounds here had a, a committee, I'm sure there's probably a fairgrounds committee or something, is there, Keith? <laughs> and, uh, and then there may be, I don't know how many people would be on that committee, but let's just say there was 10 people on that committee and there's probably a president and a vice president and a secretary and a a treasurer, etc., and we were going to spend ten thousand dollars upgrading something here on the sh on the uh, fairgrounds. And we had a meeting about it, and the quorum for that committee was, let's say, seven. Seven members of that committee had to be present in order for us to sign that check for the ten thousand dollars to be spent. So we have a meeting, and only three people turn up. We go, well, we've only got three people. We haven't got a quorum, so we can't actually make a decision. 
So even though we had three people come to a meeting and the meeting was going to be about spending $10,000, we cannot make that decision to spend the $10,000. So we reconvene the meeting and this time we get eight people come, we go, okay, so we can make that decision. So it's exactly the same in the microbial world. You, there are uh, microbes in your gut, for example, in your large intestine, which is a fermentation uh, vessel, pretty much like the rumen in a in a a cow or uh, the sorts of things that we're going to be talking about today about fermentation. That's what happens in your large intestine. That in that process, you make a lot of vitamins, or you potentially could make a lot of vitamins, especially B vitamins. But if you don't have a quorum of the microbes that make those vitamins, they'll still be there. You could analyze the, uh, your large intestine. You could find, yes, we have all these microbes that are able to make B group vitamins, but if there are not enough of them, they will not form a quorum and they will not switch on their genes for making B group vitamins. So you have to go and buy it off the shelf. So do you see what I mean? You could have, and we know in the rhizosphere there's going to be lots and lots of, there's going to be millions and trillions probably of microbes in the rhizosphere, but if there are not enough to form a quorum for something like fixing nitrogen or for producing even vitamins for the plants, plants need vitamins as well. So if those microbes in the rhizosphere haven't reached a quorum, even though there's some there, because there's always going to be some there, then it's not going to happen. So we need to understand a little bit about quorum sensing, about tipping points, about how do we, how do we actually ramp that up so we have enough of them there to make a decision. Well, if we put something like nitrogen anywhere near a seed, or obviously if it's a seed that's coated with um, or treated with insecticide or fungicide or any of those kinds of things. There is no way you're ever going to reach a quorum on anything because the side, C-I-D-E, it means poison and you got, you're poisoning things in the rhizosphere and nitrogen's pretty effective poison as well. So in human society a quorum is the number, of the number. we're talking numbers now, that must be present. So in the microbial world that term quorum sensing Again, it's density dependent, it's the numbers, and it's coordinated behavior. Once you get a certain number, then the microbes are able to actually communicate with each other, coordinate their behavior, and that regulates gene expression. This is where it gets really, really powerful, that um, bacteria are able to switch their own genes on and off. If we take a bacteria that's in the rhizosphere, in other words, the area right next to a plant root, and it's able to utilize the exudates and that kind of thing, and we move it, even just two inches away. It will switch off all the genes that it had switched on while it was in the rhizosphere and switch on a whole lot of other ones because it's in a different environment and it needs to get its energy in a different way. So bacteria are very, very adept at switching genes on and off. They're also adept at horizontal gene transfer, transferring genes into other organisms. And now that we know more about viruses, we know that they're doing that all the time. Um, so this is, it's because, not not just because there's lots of microbe, it's because when they reach a certain number that they can actually alter genetic expression. That's where the power comes from. So it's density dependent, coordinated behaviour. It occurs in all species of bacteria, archaea, fungi and viruses. Every single species that's been analysed, and that's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of species, all use quorum sensing. And in fact, it's now look, it now appears to be used in all other groups as well, like protozoa and other like higher order animals use quorum sensing as well. And we probably, well, we do, don't we? <laughs> we? If we have a meeting about something, there has to be a quorum or we don't make a decision. So every species produces its own unique signal and these signals are called auto-inducers. And we're going to be talking about auto-inducers today because what, we, what we're doing when we use a biostimulant is actually we are producing auto-inducers and it's the auto-inducers that we're going to apply to our seeds or um, using our foliar sprays. And when the concentration of auto-inducers in the environment reaches a critical level, that's when it regulates gene expression. So in your plants, that might be their productivity or their tolerance to, to stresses in the environment. Now microbes are also multilingual. They don't only just produce a signal that tells them how many of their own kind there are, but they have a mo um, so they have a molecule that says me, so I can find out how many, if I was a lactobacillus, how many ki other kinds of my species of lactobacillus there are. Um, and then there's a second language that's generic, which is interspecies communication, so bacteria will know 
how many other kinds of bacteria there are, not just their own species, and how many kinds of fungi and other things are out there. It's incredibly uh, complex signaling system. And these tiny little single-celled organisms are extraordinarily uh, clever, if you like, at sensing where they are in the world and how many of their own there are in that space and how many others there are in that space. Because when you think of the things that they can collectively do um, and how small they are, it's quite extraordinary how they actually do that. So they know how many of us, how many of them, and then they actually use that information to decide what task to carry out. I can send you, I don't know whether everyone's, I don't know whether Becky's got you all on a, on a, like on an email, like on an email list or something, but um, if there's some really good videos on this, um, in fact, if you want to write it down, there's a lady called Bonnie Bassler, B-O-N-N-I-E, and then capital B-A-S-S-L-E-R, Bonnie Bassler. She has spent basically her entire research career investigating quorum sensing in the human body. Um, but she talks not only about how it works in our bodies, but some general, she's got some lovely little graphics there of how these molecules are actually transferred and how they, the receptor sites, how they're produced, how they're received, how microbes, it's, it's called How Bacteria Talk. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what it's called. So Bonnie Bassler, How Bacteria Talk, and it's a YouTube video. It's 18 minutes, but I promise you the 18 minutes goes really, really fast because it's a very, very engaging YouTube. Uh, and that will explain a lot of the background to, if you think about, okay, she's talking about the human body, but we can think about how this works in soils. So the information is used to decide what task to carry out. Um, and I think she might actually in that YouTube video, she may relate that to the, to the human body as well. So if you think about it, you're an amalgamation of all these different organs um, your lungs and your heart, your liver and your spleen, your adrenals and <clears throat> whatever. And then you have your pituitary and your hypothalamus uh, and your adrenals are sort of sending out messages all of the time. You've got that HPA axis, they call it, where there's all this, even at the moment while you're sitting there figuring out how this works for soils, your body is undertaking a whole lot of tasks that you're not even thinking about. And it's doing that in a coordinated way. And how can it be, you know, why, how do the kidneys know they have to function as kidneys and your liver functions as a liver and your, um, your spleen is doing something else and your heart's beating away and your lungs are, you're breathing and hopefully your brain's working and all of this is because you're coordinated as a single living thing by the biochemical signalling that's going on in your body all of the time. And if you didn't have that biochemical signalling, if you didn't know when you were hungry, if you didn't know when you were tired, if you didn't know um, that you're, you need to produce some of this enzyme or some of that enzyme or some of this hormone or some of that hormone, if all of those things weren't working, then you wouldn't function as a unified living organism. And what we need to think about of this in terms of the soil is of it being a living thing that has a whole lot of functions, there's a whole lot of tasks that need to be completed and there are different functional groups of microbes that are important to those tasks, which is why plant diversity is incredibly important because every plant will have its own microbiome. Even within a species, like even with something in, within something like wheat or corn, all the different varieties of corn and all the different varieties of wheat will have distinct microbiomes. So even if you were just even having one, you're just going to grow wheat. Sometimes there's an advantage of putting four or five different varieties of wheat in together just to give you a little bit of diversity. So that we have to start thinking about these different functional groups and how they all work together. But not only that, but how many numbers? What are the numbers in those functional groups? So it could sound complicated, but in actual fact, if we just understand what the game rules are, what the rules like, you know, we need diversity, we need numbers, then we just need to start actually pulling on that string, as Jerry says. That we've always been pushing on it. We keep pushing things onto plants and saying, here, we'll give you some nitrogen, we'll give you this. What happens when you push on a string? You don't get very far, right? So we just need to pull on that. Well, what are the main things that we need to, what are the essential things here? Plant diversity and doing something to get, to enable microbes to do what microbes do best. Basically get out of the way and let them get on with it, right? But we can help a lot with stimulating this uh, this process of um, 
communities of organisms that are interdependent, that all need each other, so diversity is very important and there's no such thing as an independent organism. We cannot exist on this planet without, for example, the plants and the marine plankton that provide the oxygen for us to breathe. We can't exist on this planet unless there are things to eat and we depend on all of these uh, other life forms to, to bring those things to us. So we all need other species in order to survive and all plant, animal and human genes, all the genes that make us up, our DNA, uh, can be influenced by quorum sensing in that embedded and surrounding microbial population. So how are we going to utilise this for our benefit? Um, we just want these microbes to be able to do the things that we want them to do even better. So if we look at how this applies to agriculture, we have to actually look at how soil works. Yes, Keith? Ah, yes. Christine was kind enough to write a really good article on quorum sensing. It's on page 29. Don't look at it now because I want you to listen to Christine. But take, take this home with you and you can read this multiple times. It's a really good summary of what she just talked about. It's on page 29. Uh, but you, you probably have to read it through several times to really get it. But you've got a good summary of what she just talked about right here. Actually, thanks for mentioning that, Keith, because uh, if you do look at it now, <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry. I have to try not to breathe when I'm looking down. But um, you, on page 29, you'll see there's two photographs at the bottom of this of that page, and one of the one on the left is plant roots that don't have a quorum, so they're not connected to the soil in any way. And that's what we're doing when we add nitrogen to the soil. We're actually creating those bare. If you can see the roots, then there's no quorum there. Um, and then the one on the right hand side is plant roots that have um, great microbial structures around them, a biofilm, well aggregated soil, fungal hyphae, all kinds of things. And you can't see the roots because they're in behind those particles. And then if you turn over to uh, pages 30 and 31, there's an article there called Nitrogen, the Double-Edged Sword. Um, thanks for reminding me about that, Keith. I'd forgotten this was in, in there. So there's the impacts of inorganic nitrogen um, a little bit about the liquid carbon pathway, which is just what I'm going to be talking about now. And in fact, there's a photograph that I'm going to put up very soon that's like that honey, the one that looks like honeycomb on the bottom of page 30. Um, so yes, you can definitely go back and, and have a look over those. And in fact, over the page, there's a, an article on our vascular mycorrhizal fungi by uh, Wendy Tahari. And you'll see some... Uh, what a plant root looks like when it's been colonised by mycorrhizal fungi and then over the page you'll see some, on page 33, you'll see some photographs of mycorrhizal spores which is very similar to that photograph that I put up at the beginning of this session. So yeah, so there's, there's a whole lot of really, oh well, how can I say it's a whole lot of really good stuff? Wendy's, Wendy's article. <laughs> no, there's, I mean, there's, there's just the photographs which I think really do help to understand what is going on in the soil and how you can recognise on your own farm if you've got a spade. So the two things that you really need to, um, two essential pieces of equipment on a farm is a spade and it needs to be in the back of the pickup because it's no good if it's in the shed, in the shop, uh, and you need to use it. So every time you go out looking at your crop, please dig up some plants and have a look at the roots. And a refractometer. How many of you have a refractometer, little thing about this big. Mm, okay, well, we need to see 100% of hands come up. A refractometer um, is a way of determining how much sugar and minerals and trace elements are in the sap of your plants. And if it's not a very big number, then the roots aren't communicating with microbes in the soil. So you can tell by using a spade to dig a hole and have a look and see whether the roots, I'm, I'm just actually getting to this now, um, how, how can we tell whether we've actually got a quorum form, forming around plant roots? And then you can use your refractometer to measure the sap of your plants to see uh, whether those minerals and trace elements are actually getting up into the plant. So what you're going to do with a, to use a refractometer is you're going to use a garlic press. You're going to grab some leaves and you're going to use a garlic press or something. You're going to roll them up, stick them into a garlic press, squeeze. Get a, please get a stainless steel one because aluminium ones Oh, how do you say that in this country? But anyway, it's not aluminium, is it? Aluminum. Aluminum. Never can get that right. 
Um, aluminum ones break really easily, so you need a stainless steel garlic press. You squeeze a drop of the sap onto a little plate on your refractometer. You're going to put another one over the top of that and you're going to hold it up to the light. And what you're looking at is the refractive index of that liquid. In other words, how much dissolved solid is in that liquid. If you put a drop of distilled water on that plate and held it up to the light, you'd get a reading of zero. It would have nothing in it. Um, if you get a reading of two or three, it means it's hardly got anything in it. So what you would want is a reading above 12 at least, um, because if your plant is brixing at 12 or more, it will have uh, insect resistance and resistance to fungal pathogens. In other words, it's got plenty of minerals and trace elements in it, and it's also, in order to do that, it's got lots of exudates coming out of the roots, so it's photosynthesizing faster and it's supporting the soil microbiome. There's a good chance it's going to have all the secondary plant compounds in it that it needs to defend itself. I would pref prefer to see crops brixing above 20, um, and certainly we have Australians getting up above those, even up to 30, but um, it takes a while to, to get up there. You definitely want to be brixing over 12, though. All right, so the definition of soil, and thanks for that, Keith. So it doesn't matter what kind of soil you have, really. Um, I know there's a lot of emphasis. What am I holding that for? I'm not even talking into that. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> um, so your soil is going to be weathered rock materials of sand, silt, and clay. And every one of you is going to have different combinations of those. Every paddock is going to have different combinations and even parts of your paddock will have different combinations. But if they haven't been in contact with plant roots at some stage in their history, it's not going to be soil. So if you go somewhere in the world where there aren't any plants, like where it's too hot, too dry, too cold, something, too something for plants to grow, like you know, high up on the top of a mountain where it's too cold or in the middle of the Sahara Desert where it's too dry. If there are no plants there, there won't be any soil there. You'll find weathered rock particles, but you won't find what we call topsoil. So if we want to have fertile, rich topsoil, um, it requires plant roots. So the fertile topsoil that you, that was fertile topsoil that was here had, on the plains was um, developed by the prairies. And it's, in most cases, those beautiful molasols that are actually grassland soils. Soil forms much better under the under grass cover than it does in forests. So in areas like, say, in the east, where it was um, forested at the time of European settlement, once you remove those trees, you lose topsoil very, very quickly, and you just get down to bare subsoil in a very short amount of time. Because trees don't form topsoil, but grasses do. So you're very fortunate in this part of the world that you had the kinds of soils that were formed by grasses over hundreds, thousands of years. Um, and that now one of the issues that we've had is not having enough plant roots in there for enough length of the year. So you have a, you know, a cash crop there for a certain amount of time and then there was a tradition of having bare ground between those cash crops. And that's really been what has resulted in a lot of the loss of biological activity and that's why one reason why cover crops are so important is to have something living in that soil because it's living plant roots that actually form topsoil from where the rock minerals, but we also have to look at, well, there's a lot more things going on there that we need biology for, not just for soil formation. So plant roots are important because our green plant is the only thing that can turn these elements that are in the air um, and transform, transform light in combination with these elements into biochemical energy, which is what the plant builds itself from. So the leaves and the roots are built from carbon from the atmosphere, and then there's exudates from the roots that actually will turn uh, weathered rock minerals into fertile topsoil. So all this soil we're looking at here has actually been built by these plant roots. And this is a beautifully, you can't tell from the back of the room, but it's a lovely aggregated um, porous soil so that, you know, when it rains, the water can go in and can go right into depth. Um, and there's lots of air in there. We need to have lots of air in soil because the air is 78% nitrogen. And if we want our free living nitrogen fixing bacteria to be down here working, fixing in, then the air needs to get down there as well as the water getting down there. And we know that plant root, imp plant root inputs, like the exudates coming from plants, they build soil carbon five to 30 times faster than carbon derived from above ground biomass. So in other words, we have roots and litter, leaves, um, crop residues, that sort of thing breaking down. Most of that goes back to be carbon dioxide and never actually stays in the soil. But the plants must be growing in association with beneficial microbes for this to happen. So we've got lots and lots of acres of crops across the United States, millions of acres of crops where we've got green plants and they've got roots, but they're not building topsoil. So 
So just having a green plant is not enough to build topsoil unless that plant is actually growing in association with beneficial microbes and that's where we've come unstuck over the last 50 years because our plants haven't been growing in association with beneficial microbes. If they are growing with microbes, they look like this, where well, you can't see the roots basically because the roots will have riser sheaths on them. Um, these ones down at the bottom that are clean is only because that plant got yanked out of the ground. We didn't use a spade or anything and then we looked at it and went, oh, that'll, take a, that'll be a good photo. Um, if we'd used a spade to dig it out, these ones would have had riser sheaths on them as well. So a riser sheath is like a column of soil that surrounds a plant root. You can pull it off easily, uh, but it's the biological, uh, the metabolic processes that are important for the nourishment of that plant are actually inside, taking place inside that riser sheath. It's a very protected environment where the microbes can get on and do what they need to do. Um, if you just look at a root under a microscope, you'll see there's a plant root there and you'll start to see all these little uh, bits of sticky substance holding roots on when riser sheaths first start to form. And then when they form properly, you'll see um, like the photo that's in the book. So this is the plant root over here and these are the soil particles over here. So this is the inside of a riser sheath. You can see these hyphae of fungi. Some of those will be symbiotic fungi like mycorrhiza and trichoderma. And then there's a whole lot of saprotrophic fungi that are just really basically feeding on the sugars that come out of that plant. Um, and that's all they're there for. They're not forming a symbiotic relationship with the plant. They're just feeding off the plant. And you see little droplets of liquid here, which is your liquid carbon pathway. The things that you can't see there are the microbes and the archaea. Uh, sorry, the microbes. The bacteria and the archaea that are much, much smaller. They're much smaller than, than fungi. So if we went to a higher level of magnification, we'd, that we wouldn't be able to see anything because the whole thing would just be a massive a mass of microbes. So they're basically trillions. Like if you, even in that area there, there are trillions of bacteria all um, doing things like, you know, fixing nitrogen and solubilizing phosphorus and bringing other elements that are important to the plant. And as I said before, some of those are actually going to be eaten by that plant if they get too close to this side over here, they're going to get eaten. So we go back off a bit and this is a lower level of magnification. This photo is in the book. Um, this is how the soil particles are glued together in little lumps in that riser sheath and then there's spaces so that air can get in there and water can get in there and this is a beautifully aggregated soil. When you get uh, aggregated topsoil, you can dig it with your hand, you won't even need a spade. If we look at this in a 3D graphical version, this is your compacted soil over here on this side. Is there any way we, we can't turn the lights off on that side? Anyway, I hope you can still see that. Um, all the soil particles are just packed in really hard together and there's no air or space between them. On this side, we have an aggregated soil where the particles stick together. So you've got the same number of particles in that area there, but there's all these spaces between the particles. This is what we're aiming for with well-structured soil. And it's like, a, it's essential to all of the other things that we want to happen. And that structure can only come through microbial glues and gums, and they won't produce those glues and gums unless there's enough of them. So if we, again, now, if we just look at inside, say, one of these macro aggregates here, um, you've probably seen this diagram before, if you've heard me talk before. Um, I, think, I don't know whether that one's in here. No, it's not in this book, I don't think. But it's on my website. If you go to www.amazingcarbon.com, there's an article there called Nitrogen, the Double-Edged Sword, and this diagram is in there. So this is a macro aggregate, the blue bit. It's shown as being blue because the moisture content inside a macro aggregate is higher than it is on the outside. This is our fine feeder root. And remember, it's the new roots, the young roots, and the feeder roots are the ones that are actually activating the soil biology. Older roots don't do this. We've got root hairs coming off here. We've got mycorrhizal hyphae. Mycorrhiza go right into that plant root and then stretch out. So the mycorrhiza are pulling the whole thing together into a macro aggregate, and then these little orange shapes here are your soil microaggregates and these are being formed by bacteria. Again, the bacteria that are forming these microaggregates are using energy that's coming out of this plant root. So the plant root is like exuding all kinds of not just carbon, not just uh, energy rich compounds, but all kinds of signaling molecules. So these ellipses here are bacteria of all different kinds, thousands of different kinds of bacteria and they're all capable of doing different things. And depending on what the plant needs, 
it will produce different exudates that will stimulate different ones uh, of these to provide it with what it needs. So we don't have to even think what the plant needs because the plant knows what it needs and the plant will signal to the bacteria and they will respond to that need and bring those things to the plant in exchange for the energy. And one of the other things that happens here in, in addition to the nutrition for the plant is that all these microbes work together to form a product, a, a carbon compound called humus, which is about 60% carbon, 68% nitrogen, always in those ratios, and a little bit of phosphorus and sulphur. And they're always in those same ratios. Doesn't matter where in the world, what kind of soil it was, humus always has the same analysis. And if you add those things, they come to about 70% and the other 30% are minerals that are in the soil, like iron, for example, which form part of that complex. So if we have a look at that just diagrammatically, just the uh, organic, well, the, the uh, bits that came from the atmosphere, the carbon, the hydrogen, the nitrogen, the oxygen, and see how they're all joined together in this humic molecule. So the carbon atoms are in rings, what we call rings, which are six carbon atoms forming a hexagon. So there's a carbon ring, carbon ring, carbon ring, and then we've got um, the other elements, some of them in rings as well, joined in and chains. Um, if you were a chemist and you, you know, were interested in different kinds, how different elements combine together into chemical um, compounds and how they're all bonded together. But the extraordinary thing about this, when you actually look at that structure, is to think about the fact that uh, somebody joined all those elements together, all those atoms. Like, how did the, the the glucose that was formed in photosynthesis was six carbon atoms in a chain and that's gone through the plant and, and come out as, as a sugar rich exudate. There's been other exudates as well. There's oxygen and nitrogen that are in the atmosphere that bacteria are actually involved in utilising those and fixing those. But somehow or another that microbial community living around a plant root has taken all those different elements and joined them together in a very um, stable polymer. So once you have a humic polymer, it's very, very difficult for to, to break that down. Humic polymers can actually stay in the soil for thousands of years. So why did the microbes go to all that trouble to convert the carbon compounds that were coming out of plant roots into humic polymers when they could have just used the carbon for energy and be done with it? They could have just eaten it and lived and died and, oh well, that's what life's about if you're a microbe, right? You use energy, you divide, you produce more of yourself. Why would the microbes go to so much trouble to join all those different atoms together to make humic polymers? There's a lot of work goes into that. We don't know how to do it. In the laboratory, humans can't make humus. Even though it sounds a bit like human, humans, humus. So why did the microbes bother to do that when they could have used all those energy rich compounds that were coming out of the plant roots just for their own place to live. yeah a place to live for who for the microbes yeah they could have done that for a place to live and then yeah so that's I guess the same like creating habitat right a place to live and then if you're going to live there in that place what else do you need so so you've got somewhere to live so you've actually improved the soil so it's better for you to live in. What else do you need as well as somewhere to live? You need food. Where's that going to come from? It's going to come from the plant. So would having all this around a plant root be of any benefit to the plant? Yes? How would, how would having better soil structure around a plant be of benefit to the plant? Steve, I am looking at you. No, how would having better soil structure around the roots of a plant be of a benefit to the plant? Why would having better soil structure around the roots of a plant be of a benefit to the plant? Yeah, and exactly. So why do we want better soil? We want better soil structure for plants, right? So who has created better soil structure for the plants? The microbes. Why did the microbes create better soil structure for the plants? Sorry? Yeah, more roots. And more roots means more what? More food. 
So if you were a microbe living around a plant root, remember that diagram I showed you of all the microbes living in the rhizosphere, who's looking after those microbes? Where are they getting everything they need from? Yeah, sunlight. And who's converting the sunlight into things that they need? Plants. So if there wasn't a plant there, the microbes aren't going to be there, right? Remember I said the biggest issue that you've had over the last 50 years here in the United States is bare ground because there's, the prairies had plants, hundreds of different kinds of plants, 500 to 700 different kinds of plants even in a, an area say four times the size of this room. Hundreds of different kinds of plants all growing together capable of responding to rain at any time of the year. No matter when it rained there was a plant there that could grow in response to that rain and what did that plant do when it grew? photosynthesized, it produced root exudates that fed soil microbes. So the microbial community that was living under that prairie had energy coming into it all year round. Just imagine how diverse that plant can be. If we know that there was hundreds of different kinds of plants, imagine how many microbial communities there were. And what did they do? They built six foot of beautiful, deep, rich black soil, right? Your mollusols, your grassland soils. Plants didn't do that. The microbes living in association with the plant roots did that. And why did the microbes bother to do that? Because if they don't keep the plants alive, they die. It, you have a similar thing happens in your gut. If you're somebody that needs to have sugar, if you feel addicted to sugar, it's because you have bacteria in your gut that utilise sugar for energy. And when you, uh, you have some sugar and, or something sweet, and they proliferate and then, oh, they run out of sugar. So they're going to send a very powerful signal to your brain for you to eat sugar because if you don't eat something sweet, they die. It's a very, very powerful signal for you, those of you who are addicted to sugar, you'll know that you'll crave sugar. And in fact, it's very, very hard to get over a sugar craving. But if you haven't had sugar for years, I haven't had sugar for something like 20 years. And honestly, I could... We had a chocolate tasting in California. Do you remember that, Jerry? We were tasting all these different chocolates and they were like 82, 88, 92% uh, cacao and then obviously varying amounts of... Th so the one that was like 92% dark chocolate didn't have much sugar in it. And then we tasted one that was about 60% cacao, I think, and, and the sugar was just like, whoa, way too high. And most of you probably would have been... Maybe if you're addicted to sugar, you would think the 60% one wasn't even sweet enough. So we, the reason that we're addicted to sugar is because the microbes in your gut are craving sugar. And if you don't keep on feeding them sugar, then they, they'll just disappear and you, that craving will go away. So microbes send very powerful signals. We don't realise how much they're controlling us as well for, for those various cravings. So I've lost my train of thought completely now. Why, why is that relevant? I've got no idea. But the, the microbes, well, the plant will be, the plant signals to the microbes for what it needs and the microbes respond and together they actually work as a unit. Like the plants and the microbes are meant to work together. And one of the things they're doing, the microbes are actually producing humic substances around plant roots to help keep that plant alive. Because if the plant, oh, that's what it was. If the plant dies, if you stop eating sugar, the microbes in your gut die. That was the relationship. If that plant dies, everything that lives around the roots is going to die. So it's to the microbes' advantage to actually support that plant. And that's what they're trying to do. And we keep interfering by putting things on seeds and around seeds and under seeds, other than what we need to put on a seed is something that's actually going to stimulate these microbes in the soil. We're not going to put microbes on the seed. We're going to put something that stimulates the ones that are in the soil that can do this. So the nitrogen in that molecule, the, oh, whoops, Christina, press the right button. These blue ones, there's nitrogen in that molecule. It has to be fixed biologically, like it has to be fixed by the microbes involved in making humic substances. Um, if we apply it outside of that, if we just put nitrogen, inorganic nitrogen onto the soil, the microbes that that stimulates, it does stimulate a whole lot of bacteria, different kinds of bacteria other than the ones we want, uh, they will break down these humic polymers to get the carbon out because they need carbon and nitrogen in their bodies. So adding nitrogen to the soil breaks carbon down. Having natural biological nitrogen fixation take place in the soil builds carbon up. And nitrogen and carbon always move together. If your soil's losing carbon, it's using nitrogen. If it's building carbon, it's building nitrogen. They're in the same molecule. They're together in the same molecule. 
So it has to be fixed biologically for carbon to be sequestered in a stable form. So this pathway photosynthesis um, to make the carbon compounds in the first place, they have to be translocated to the roots and we get aggregates forming around the roots and rhizosheaths and humification. And I think you'll find um, something about the liquid carbon pathway on page 30 in the, in the book. So we have to have actively growing green plants and preferably a whole lot of different kinds of those and we have to have a diversity of beneficial microbes which is what we're um, going to be talking about today. So what we've done in the past is to try and replicate or to replace biological activity with chemical fertilisers um, but the plants supported by the high analysis fertilisers actually can't get all the other minerals and trace elements that they need. So let's just look at one example of a farming family that have supported microbes rather than using high analysis fertilizers and that's one reason actually why we're having this workshop here today um, because these um, Ian and Diane Haggerty from Wild Catcham in Western Australia were over in Picinus Ranch in February this year and Keith was there and there was lots of discussions about how they were farming. They're farming 40,000 acres now and they're not using any nitrogen fertilizer at all. They're out yielding all their neighbors. They've got higher quality grain. Um, higher valued grain and they're now getting markets in Malaysia for nitrate free grain. So if their grain is nitrate free, the uh, Asians have figured out that if it's nitrate free it also, they don't have to test for fungicides or insecticides or glyphosate or any of those things because it won't be in there because they don't need to use those. They don't need to use anything because um, it's nitrogen that's actually created the conditions where we have all the weeds and we have the insects and we have the pests that we have to deal with with all these other chemicals. And Ian and Diane are going to be speaking at No-Till on the Plains in January next year. So they will be coming back to the United States but there has been a lot of interest in, okay, so how are they actually managing to farm without nitrogen? So I realise it's a very different environment to here. Um, so I just wanted to very quickly uh, mention what they were doing. So they've supported the soil microbiome by retaining a diversity of green plants all year as far as climate allows. They've replaced their N and, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers. They use vermi liquid, which is a worm liquid, uh, which is a worm leachate, uh, and they use compost extract. They put on the seed, they have liquid inject, and they have a post-sowing uh, foliar spray on the, on the leaves of their wheat, and they integrate livestock as well. I think it's important um, to say that they do do that. Bricks levels in their wheat up to 28. Any of you who use the refractometer, you know it's pretty hard to get up to 28. Um, and their neighbour next door will be bricksing around two or three. So their plants are photosynthesising 10 times faster than their neighbours, which explains in part why they're getting uh, higher yields, better quality grain, building soil. Um, and the first time I came across the Haggerty's was in relation to, to a survey that was done by the Wheat Belt NRM. So the area in Western Australia where people grow wheat is called the Wheat Belt. I guess like you have your a corn belt and um, the wheat belt NRM decided to test the soils on 50 <coughs> wheat belt farms and luckily the Haggerty's were involved in that. It was just a random, you know, stick a pin on a map kind of a thing and luckily they were under one of those pins. Um, this is what, about 8 million hectares or I don't know what that is, it's a lot anyway. I think it's about 15 million acres of uh, wheat country, looks like in the, in uh, Western Australia over summer. So it's just bare ground every year, year after year, and everybody is encouraged to keep it bare. So they'll probably spray three times, two or three times every summer to keep that. We grow wheat over, over winter. Uh, so imagine South, Southern California, moist, wet winter and hot, dry summer. Um, the Haggerty's over summer, their country looks like that. There's actually wheat stubble all through that, so that this photo was the neighbours just across the fence and that's in there. So there's wheat stubble but they just let everything else grow through it because they've got sheep and the fact that they've had green stuff over summer means that they have built a lot more carbon than their neighbours. So when the um, soil scientists came and sampled these paddocks compared to their neighbours paddocks uh, using the protocols developed by the National Soil Carbon Research Programs, this is all very high level science um, with lots and lots of replicates. Um, and three depths, it was, they, they ended up with like hundreds of samples that went into this. What they found was that compared to their neighbours, the Haggerty's had increased carbon by 41.5%, nitrogen by 30%, even though they don't use any, and the water holding capacity increased by 13%. And when we look at the depths where that was, the top four inches of the soil 
um, had increased about 37% carbon, then the next level down 41%, and then the next level down, like even down at 12 inches, that increased soil carbon by 54%. So remember what I said about it's the root tips where the exudates come out. So if you think of their wheat, um, it's at the, around the bottoms of the wheat plant where most of the exudates are. So when that pathway is functioning effectively and you're measuring soil carbon at different depths, you'll find that the greatest increase in soil carbon is wherever the most of the root tips were. So not necessarily it's going to be anywhere near the surface. Whereas when you've got crop residues breaking down, you get a little bit of carbon form near the soil surface. But once you get down to 12 inches depth, you've generally got no change in soil carbon down there, which is what we, when we saw the change to minute from tillage to no-till, we've got an increase in carbon right at the surface. And there was a lot of people talking about the fact, yeah, but you're not increasing carbon down here. It's actually not making any change. And if you want water to actually infiltrate down there, we need to think more about, which is one of the advantages of your cover crops and having something living between cash crops is that you've got living roots down. This is why there's so much emphasis on living roots because it's down at the root tips where you've got carbon coming out and therefore you're changing the whole soil profile. You're going to get better infiltration and you're going to get more moisture at depth. And if we look to see what their wheat roots are doing, we see like here's a wheat seed here. It's got a coleoptile, which is like a little sheath that pushes up through the soil. The root, the, the leaves will come out of the top of that. It hasn't even produced any leaves yet. Um, and the roots that came out of that wheat seed when it first germinated are totally covered with riser sheaths. So there's a huge amount of biological activity taking place in the roots of those plants before it has even produced leaves. And when, uh, if they send, plant roots off to the lab to be tested for mycorrhizal colonisation. Even at that stage, there'll be about 75% of the roots will be colonised by mycorrhiza, whereas um, conventional wheat, there, there will probably be none at that early stage. And then later on, I'm, I know it's hard to see with the lights there, but um, when when the it's actually at the stage of having three tillers there, there's it, this soil that's all sticking around the plant roots like that is actually new topsoil that's being built by those plants. So that's act, they're actively building topsoil and, and um, improving soil structure. And that's a closer, I think, I'm not sure whether that photo is in, the, in your booklet or not, but that's what the soil looks like. That's actually from the Haggerty's. Um, that's what it looks like when you try to take a photo of the roots. It actually looks like that under a microscope. And then the neighbour's wheat looks like that. It's the same magnification under a microscope. So you can see that there's no soil really sticking to these. So the neighbour has to keep applying nitrogen to feed those plants. And this is an example, I think this one might be in the book too, of wheat seeds here where there's nitrogen put under the seed. So there's clean roots under the seed and then compost put on top of the soil. So all these roots have riser sheaths in the presence of the compost and these roots are bare because they're in the presence of nitrogen. So if, you know that's why you need the spade to actually dig your plants up and have a look at the roots and see what, see what they look like. So we had a field day there in October last year. Um, this is Ian Haggerty. There's a little... Uh, four minute video of Ian talking about how they actually get auto inducers on the seeds. Um, so if I send you that link, you'll see, uh, you'll see Ian there and Diane standing behind him. But this barley crop that's just behind them there, I'll just take a photo of it here. This is a very low rainfall environment. They're in an 80-inch 80, 80 rainfall environment and they've produced a really beautiful, like I said, thousands and thousands of acres of beautiful barley, triticale, oats, wheat. Last year, there's no weeds in there. There's no disease issues. Um, it was just a really magnificent crop. And um, that's, a, that's a salt lake there in the background. So that's very saline, sodic, acidic, everything you can think of soil, and yet they have no trouble producing crops. And the other thing that we, we see there, uh, and in many other situations as well, there's lots of big words here, but when living things behave symbiotically, in other words, where they work together, like plants and microbes. They have emergent properties. In other words, things happen um, that we, we can't, that reductionist science can't predict. And one of the things that has happened on the Haggerty's is that where they've planted the wheat, so this is the next year in a wheat field, there's all these grasses, native perennial grasses, like your prairie grasses, that are coming up in the rows exactly where they planted the wheat, so which is um, really interesting. They, look at these ones here, just coming through. Um, like as if they've all been sown there. So those seeds, there's the native grasses coming up where they planted the wheat. 
So the seeds have been there for who knows, 100 years or something since those grasses were considered to be extinct in that area. If you talk to the Department of Agriculture, they'll even say there never even were native grasses there. Um, and now they are all coming up in the wheat rows. So there's something going on here in terms of the biological stimulation is not only stimulating their plants to grow better, but also stimulating everything else that's in the soil, including seeds that theoretically weren't even there or haven't been there, been seen there for a very long time. And another close, these are native grasses, perennial grasses, so they don't even have to plant those to get, they've got sheep, so they're very happy to get native grasses back again. And all they did was plant a crop with auto inducers on the seed. So what we're going to be talking about today is biostimulants. Um, what are they? And using the Haggerty's, I guess, was like that, that they were the stimulant, the biostimulant for, um, for these workshops and, uh, and the fermentation process. So what's so special about fermentation? Well, fermentation is what happens in our large intestine. Fermentation is what happens in the rumen of a cow. Fermentation happens in the gut of, a, of an earthworm and we know that vermiliquid and vermicast and those kinds of earthworm products are very, very beneficial for plants. We can make beer with fermentation, we can make wine with fermentation, we can have fermented foods um, that have become very popular these days. So what is it so special about fermentation? Well, in that fermentation process there are actually millions billions and trillions of microbes involved in fermentation. As I said, one drop of rumen fluid has 10,000 times more microbes in it than there are humans on the planet. So when we have a, an environment where fermentation is taking place, we know that it's a very microbially rich environment. And the microbes that are in that environment are communicating with each other. And they're producing these auto-inducers that I talked about to sense how many of them are and who's doing what and whatever. So they're all basically talking to each other, if I can use that word. Bonnie Bassler uses it, so I guess if she says how bacteria talk, I can talk about them talking to each other. And what we want to do in agriculture is basically capture the essence of that. We want to capture something about those conversations. Um, we want to do something that will encourage a seed to behave differently. So when you think about a seed in the soil, a seed can sense, if it was the, let's go back to the prairie for a moment, when you had cool season plants and warm season plants in the prairie, you had some plants that germinated naturally now, I'm talking about wild plants, some plants that germinated in springtime and some plants that germinated in fall and they were the two main germination times of the year. Um, something that germinates in spring and grows over summer will not germinate in fall because it's going to die over winter. And how does it know whether it's fall or whether it's spring? Like it could rain in springtime and it could be exactly the same soil temperature as when it rains in fall and it's, you could have two situations where you've got the same amount of rain and had the same temperature and one of them was springtime and one of them was fall. And there will be seeds that will come up in fall and seeds that will come up in spring and they will not confuse that. They know. The seed knows how far it is from the soil surface. If you take a seed and plant it 10 feet down and, and, and the soil's moist, it will not germinate because that would be suicidal. There's no way that it can make it back to the soil, to the top of the soil. If you took that same seed that had been planted 10 feet down and it had been there for five years or something and then you dug it up and you planted it now, you know, half an inch from the soil surface and watered it, it will emerge. So how did it know it was half an inch from the soil surface versus 10 feet from the soil surface? How does the seed know or sense how far it is from another plant? How does it sense whether it's under a tree or away from a tree? Or what other kinds of plants are around it? So a seed has all kinds of messages coming through the seed coat all of the time. The temperature, the moisture, what other plants are near it, how deep it is in the soil, all of these things. It is a very, very, very sensitive um, package of plant intelligence. Uh, unfortunately, we bred a lot of those things out of seeds when we've, we, with our things that we use, um, our, like our commercial cash crops aren't quite as intelligent as wild seeds, but they still do have a lot of intelligence in them. And through their seed coat, they can sense what 
is in the surrounding environment. So if a seed was in a very microbially rich environment, as it was in the prairie, when it rains and the soil is moist and the temperature's right, it is also going to be able to sense whether there are a lot of microbes around it or whether there are not. And how is it going to be able to tell through its seed coat, through the moisture that comes into its seed coat, how is it going to be able to tell whether there's a lot of microbes in the environment or not around it? How is it going to be able to tell that? What's it going to pick up on in that water that comes into the seed coat? What's it going to be sensing in the moisture that comes into that seed coat? What is it? How is it going to know? Do you think that bacteria living outside the seed are going to end up inside the seed? Oh, I think I need to get the sack as a speaker. What do you reckon, Steve? Sorry? So if you're a seed and you're all in the business of planting seeds, I presume, for either forage production or grain production or something, and you're going to put that seed at a certain depth in the soil because you know that if you put it too deep or you leave it on the surface, it's probably not going to germinate as well. So you, you know in a way that the seed knows, right, where you put it. It's going to affect how well it grows. You know that it needs water. You know it needs a certain temperature. And the seed knows all that too, but we have to know that in order to do what the seed needs to grow. We have to put it in the right place and give it the right amount of water and plant it at the right time of the year. So we know that a seed knows those things, but there's other things that a seed needs as well that we're just figuring out that it needs. And it needs to be in a microbially rich environment so that it can get all the nutrients that it needs. But how does a seed know? How does a seed sense whether it is in a microbially rich environment or not? The biological signals from the microbes, and what are they called? What's the word for that? Auto inducers, thank you. So microbes communicate with each other using chemical signals called auto inducers. And they're water soluble and they spread through the environment that the microbes are living in. And a microbe uses those signals to know how many other ones are like it, how many of me are there, and how many others are there out there and to coordinate their behaviour, they're producing auto-inducers all the time. So if the water that comes into the seed coat when the seed is like ready to germinate, if that water is loaded with chemical signatures of microbes, it's loaded with auto-inducers, which are water-soluble, then the microbe is going to sense that it is in a microbially rich environment. That's how it would do it in the prairies, right? If there was one that was in a really love, lovely bit of you know, deep, fertile soil compared to one that ended up like out on, the, out on a rock somewhere or in a really shallow, you know, like maybe there was rocks under the soil surface and it's in a really just like a mineral soil that's not biologically diverse or anything. So let's say that the seed senses that it's um, in a microbially rich environment and it's just taking in some water, it's just starting to germinate is just starting, there's a whole lot of enzyme, enzymatic processes take place in the seed when it starts to germinate. How is it going to respond? Is it going to respond differently if it's in a microbially rich environment compared to not being in a microbially rich environment? Steve's going like this, what is, so what do you think it will do? If it's in a microbially rich environment, how will its behaviour be different to if it's not? That it thinks are out there that aren't actually out there. Well, in a microbially rich environment, they would be out there, right? So the microbes are out there in the soil and the seed detects that they're out there. doesn't like that word starting with D, does it? And so it is going to respond like everyone's coming to dinner, right? 
all these people are coming to suffer, so I'm going to have to feed them. So the seed will produce lots and lots of exudates in response to the fact that if it really was in a microbially diverse environment in the original prairies, when it starts to germinate, that's when it's at its most vulnerable stage. That's when it really has to form a relationship with those microbes to get the nitrogen that it needs. Let's say it was a grass plant. And corn is the grass and wheat is the grass, right? So it's something in the grass family. It's a grass plant. It doesn't have a relationship with rhizobium bacteria. It's going to have to feed nitrogen-fixing bacteria around its roots. So in that very early stage, when it first takes in moisture, it's going to start producing lots and lots of exudates to feed nitrogen-fixing bacteria to get the nitrogen that it needs to grow. So it's going to respond to the presence of microbes in its environment by feeding them. So those are all the exudates that you see when you see the rhizosheaths that have formed around the Haggerty's roots. Like they never ever see the roots on their wheat crops. When those wheat seeds are germinating, they never see roots on those plants. All they see are those thick rhizosheaths, the dreadlocks we call them. And that's because the seed has created all or has produced all those exudates to feed those microbes that in that in the Haggerty's case, they have tricked the seed, they planted the seed virtually in the desert. Those uh, WA sands are very, very infertile. They've planted the seed in a very infertile, hostile environment and tricked it into believing that it's in a very microbially rich environment by putting auto-inducers from a rich microbial environment onto the seed. And now the seed responds and it's like build it and they will come. Right? So once the seed actually, once you've actually tricked it into believing it's in a rich micro microbial environment, it will behave as if, if it is in a rich microbial environment. It will start producing lots of exudates. Whatever microbes are in the soil will respond to those and do the things that the seed wants and then plant and microbial interaction, plant intelligence if you like, takes over from that and just continues to build on that. If we took that same seed and put it into that inhospitable environment like their neighbours do using nitrogen under the seed, the seed will use that nitrogen to grow, but it won't have a microbial community around it to protect the roots. So it's quite likely to be subject to fungal pathogens around the roots or insect attack. It won't have the secondary plant compounds that it needs to have in its leaves. It's going to have a very low bricks level. So it is going to be subject to lots of insect attack, aphids and all red-legged earth mite and all kinds of things, grasshoppers you know, the locusts, whatever it is. In different parts of the world, you'll find there'll be different insects that will attack crops. I think you've got, is it corn corn borers or something that attack? You know, they, they won't attack plants that have a high bricks level. Those things will not attack plants if they have a high bricks level and, and they have all the microbes around the roots and everything that are protecting them. So we've created the environment for the things that we regard as being pests to proliferate. So are we clear on that? that what, we, what we now want to do, if we want to replicate this in agriculture, we are going to create an environment. Here we're going to talk, be talking about a fermentation process. So we're actually going to be using the compost as a way to create a fermented compost to create a microbially rich environment. Then we're going to take a cold water extract of the compost when it's finished and that cold water extract will have the chemical signals that the microbes used while they were making the compost. It's not necessarily about the compost. It was just a way of creating a fermentation environment where there will be lots of microbes producing lots of signals com to communicate with each other. And we're going to take those communication signals and we're going to put them on a seed. We're not putting microbes on a seed. We just want to make that clear right at the beginning that we are changing the the soil environment. We are changing the rhizosphere environment by tricking the seed into actually sensing through its seed coat that there's a lot of microbes out there that aren't there. Have we got that? Right. Well, it's time for a break and then Jerry is going to be actually talking about how we capture microbes from the air to form an inoculant. Uh, which is like your rhizobium inoculant, I suppose, that you put on a legume. So we're making an inoculant and then we're using that inoculant to inoculate a compost pile. And then all the microbes that are involved in the fermentation in that 
compost are going to produce auto inducers then it's the auto inducers that we're going to collect at the end of the process and we're going to either put them on the seed or put them in furrow or we'll use them as a foliar spray. That's what the rest of today is going to be about how in physical terms you're actually going to do that. But we need to know at the beginning why we're doing that. And, and if you've done an Elaningham composting course or you've made aerobic compost in the past or you've brewed compost teas, you have to forget about all that <laughs> because it is going to confuse you. If you think you're making microbes to put on the seed, you're going to get totally confused. Okay, so if you've done all that, forget it for the moment. There's nothing wrong with doing that. But this is much simpler and more effective and you don't have issues with it, whereas you can have issues going down the other way. Okay, so if you, any of you have that experience, just blot that out and just start with a clean slate. We are talking about auto inducers today. Okay, so we take a break now and then we'll come back to talk about the process.